good morning or good evening to our audience from around the globe. As part of our lecture series of distinguished speakers of the New Jersey Autism Center of Excellence, today we have the honor to host Dr. Vikram Jaswal, a true trailblazer, a pioneer in the world of scientific research for the non-speaking autistics. Dr. Jaswal is a professor at the psychology department of the University of Virginia and a main thrust of his lab is to understand communication in non-speakers. Professor Jaswell has leveraged the wearable sensor revolution of our times and combined new technology with machine learning methods to open a new line of research that will help us truly include autistics of neurodiverse backgrounds in education in society at large. As the rest of us who communicate through spoken language, the non-speaking autistics communicate through the much richer and complex body language. They do so through micro gestures that escape the naked eye of, of an observer and through overt motions that convey meaning through conventional symbols in the English language. They point and type within a social setting, often aided by someone else who accommodates a board or a keyboard, creating a form of support that helps elicit independent communication by the non-speaking autistic and enriches the social experience of communicating with another human. This new revolutionary approach from Professor Jaswell's lab that integrates traditional augmented communication with cutting edge technology offers a strength model of the non-speaking autistic, a model that unlike the current deficit model of diagnosis and treatments of autism, brings out the profound capacity for social readiness of the autistic person and helps us see the desire of autistics to empathize and to socialize with the rest of our society. Professor Jaswell has taught us a valuable lesson with his most recent work, which he will discuss in detail, that we all can and do communicate and that the door to our understanding of how this process unfolds has just, be, has just opened to the rest of us in the scientific community of autism research. His lab has initiated a path that is now past the point of no return, no return to mere opinions or suppositions or assumptions about the non-speaking autistic. His research has forever changed the landscape of autism and promises to give a voice to all in the human spectrum that makes us whole and better in the face of adversity. Let's welcome Professor Jaswell and learn from his science how to best appreciate what had up to now remained hidden to the naked eye of the observer. Well, thank you, Liz, for that kind introduction. I'm excited to have the chance to share with folks at the New Jersey Autism Center of Excellence community a little bit about some of the research, recent research from my lab. Um, I want to begin by explaining how I came to be studying questions about autism, communication, and agency. One of the major inspirations for the research I do has been a community engagement seminar on autism that I taught a few times at the University of Virginia. The seminar was called The Science and Lived Experience of Autism. These are pictures of the, the three cohorts. And each year, a group of about 20 undergraduates and 10 college age autistic young adults participated in the seminar where we learned and we laughed together and we got to know each other a little bit. And the undergraduates and I had the real privilege of getting to learn about autism alongside the real experts in autism. And that's of course the people who are living it. Uh, down here in the corner, you can see this is Elizabeth Fossler, who's the director of the Growing Kids Therapy Center. And she was my collaborator in that endeavor. My experience with this seminar, The Science and Lived Experience of Autism, really led me to question a lot of the conventional scientific wisdom about autism. And it's shaped my research program in a number of ways. So for example, one topic that was raised repeatedly by the autistic students in the course was their desire for social connection, for social interaction. And as you may know, one of the oldest most widely held beliefs about autistic people is that they are not interested in social interaction, that they lack social motivation. And so one line of my research has focused on this, what I consider to be a really erroneous and damaging belief. But that's not what I'm gonna talk about today. 
I've told you that the um, uh, community partners in our seminar were college age autistic folks, but what I haven't yet mentioned is that they are also non-speaking autistic people. So about 30% of autistic folks have limited ability to communicate using speech. Some don't say anything, some may say a few words, some repeat back words and phrases. So this is a heterogeneous group, but what they all share in common is that they don't communicate effectively using speech. We don't yet know why, but um, I'm 100% confident that it's not for lack of trying, and it's not because of lack of interest in communicating or in speaking. Unfortunately, most non-speaking autistic individuals um, are never provided an alternative conventional way to communicate effectively. By the way, I use the term non-speaking when referring to this group of folks because the individuals I know, that's how they prefer to be referred to. You may also have heard the terms non-verbal or minimally verbal. Um, without access to an effective language-based way to communicate, non-speaking folks are excluded, of course, from educational, social, community, and employment opportunities. They have no way to express what they know, to ask questions, to fill in what they don't, to share information, to talk about the past or future. Arguably, their lack of uh, an ability to communicate effectively using speech is the most debilitating aspect of their disability. And so I said this group of non-speaking individuals who participated in the university seminar, um, you know, participated and we had discussions about autism, so how did these discussions take place? Well, the folks in my seminar who were autistic all communicated in writing. They've learned over the course of many years and guided by parents and professionals to point to letters on an alphabet board, like the one you see down here on the left. Um, this alphabet board is held vertically by a trained communication partner. I want to be clear, and uh, you're going to hear me say this a few times in the course of this uh, talk, that all the students who participated in my seminar, all the non-speaking students who participated in my seminar, are working on being able to communicate independently by typing, for example, on a keyboard, but they're not here, there yet. So let me show you an example of what this kind of communication on a letter board looks like. I'm going to show you a video of a 22-year-old who began to use a letter board about six years ago. Um, she was 22 at the time and had been using it for about six years at the time the video was taken. She has limited ability to use speech. If you met her and said hello and introduced yourself, she might respond with hello and maybe give you her name, but she would not be able to use speech to respond to a question like the one you'll see here, which is, have you ever experienced uncertainty? The other thing you should know before I show you this video is that even though she cannot use speech effectively to convey her thoughts, she's reached a point in her practice of this communication method where she calls out letters verbally even before she touches them. And sometimes she'll say a word after she's pointed to all the letters in that word. So she was asked in the course of a conversation whether she experienced uncertainty. And She's wearing a camera that allows us to record her, her movements from her perspective. And I'll have more to tell you about that camera um, when we get uh, uh, later on to the methods of the study. So remember, the person that you hear anticipating the letters in speech and saying the words aloud is the letter board user herself. Have you ever experienced uncertainty? E, O, V, E, R, Y, very. O and e, everyone. D O E S I M and O D I okay. D I F F E R E N T different. So have you ever experienced uncertainty? She spells Everyone does. I'm no different. So many people have dismissed the possibility that non-speaking autistic individuals who've learned to communicate in the way that you just saw 
are actually conveying their own thoughts. They believe that it's the assistant who is the author of any text produced, that the assistant holding a letter board somehow leads the user to point to particular letters. For example, maybe the assistant moves the board in a certain way to signal a particular letter, or maybe moves the letter board underneath the user's finger until it arrives at a desired letter. I think really what this position reflects is a disbelief or an unwillingness to believe that someone who cannot talk, who's autistic, who moves in unusual ways, who acts in socially non-normative ways, could have sophisticated thoughts like everyone experiences uncertainty, I'm no different. And in fact, a question that's frequently asked is, if non-speaking autistic people have such sophisticated thoughts, why is an assistant needed to help them express it? Why can't they just sit down at a computer keyboard and type their own thoughts? The short answer is that there are non-speaking autistic people who used to communicate with assistants and who now communicate independently by typing. But it's not something that happened overnight. It required years of practice. So we have folks like those who participated in my seminar who are working on the skills needed to communicate independently, but who currently do so with assistance. And critics contend that we shouldn't believe that they're conveying their own thoughts because it's possible that they're somehow being cued by the assistant which letters to point to. So in the study I want to tell you about today, we set out to investigate how plausible a cueing explanation of letterboard users' performance was. To do this, we measured how quickly and accurately they looked at and pointed to letters as they responded to a series of questions. So to set the stage for why speed and accuracy are relevant to whether letterboard users are being cued by the assistant to point to certain letters, I have to give you a brief primer about something called Hicks Law. So one of the most robust laws in cognitive psychology is Hicks Law. And essentially it says, the more Q response alternatives there are, the longer it takes to make a response. So let me unpack that a little bit. This here is a picture of William Hick. He was a psychologist at Cambridge University. This is a study having nothing to do with autism or autistic people, but he designed an experiment to investigate the relation between the number of choices available and how long it would take someone to make a choice. Uh, the, one of the studies that he conducted went something like this. Um, participants placed their fingers on Morse code keys. So remember this study is done in the 1950s. Um, so they placed all 10 fingers on 10 Morse code keys and in front of them was a display of 10 lights in a circular arrangement. And participants had to learn which light was associated with which key. That is, sort of each light served as a cue for responding to a particular key. So if the light at the top of the circle was illuminated, for example, then maybe the correct response was to press the key that's underneath the left ring finger. What Hick then did was to manipulate the number of possible lights that would be illuminated. So sometimes it was two, sometimes it was three, and so on, up to 10. And he measured how long it took participants to press the appropriate key as he varied the number of possible cues or lights that could be illuminated. And what he showed was that reaction time increases as a function of the logarithm of the number of alternatives. That is Hick's law. And this is a really robust finding. It's been replicated many, many times, extended in various ways. Um, here, just showing you uh, data from four different uh, experimenters. Hick is up here in the upper right. Basically, on the x-axis, you can see the number of possible um, responses, possible Q response alternatives. And on the y-axis is reaction time. And what you can see is this nice linear function so that at a uh, when there are two alternatives, in Hick's case, for example, uh, it takes about 250 milliseconds for participants to make a response. And when there are 10 Q response alternatives, it takes about 500 milliseconds. So why does it take longer when there are more Q response alternatives? Well, participants have to detect the Q, retrieve which response goes with a particular Q. So, you know, if the light at the top goes off, that means I should 
press the uh, key under my left ring finger. So they have to retrieve the particular cue and they have to execute the response correctly. And so just to summarize, right, if there are more cue response alternatives, it's going to be more difficult to retrieve which response is appropriate for a given cue. That's Hicks law. So this is relevant to the letterboard user's case because if these individuals are being cued which letters to point to, their performance, you'd expect it to be limited by this constraint on information processing. The assistant would have to deliver a cue to identify which of 26 letters to point to, and the user would have to detect, decode, and act upon that cue. And each of these steps would take time and would be subject to error, especially given that there are 26 cue response alternatives. Additionally, that process would have to be repeated for each letter in a response. So in the video that I showed you, everyone does, I'm no different, the same uh, de deliver, detect, decode, act sequence would have to be repeated for each letter in that response. So if a letter board user were slow or they made lots of errors, the queuing account would be correct, but fast and accurate spelling would not be consistent with a queuing account. So in the study I'm going to tell you about, we quantitatively characterized nine experienced letter board users' performance in the wild in as naturalistic a setting as possible, as I'll explain in a moment, investigating how quickly and accurately these individuals looked at and pointed to letters as their spelling. So you can see some of the characteristics of the sample here. These were young adults between 15 and 26 years of age, and they've been using the letter board for, on average, a couple of years. Um, a minimum of, of two years. And importantly, all of them had been involved in several kinds of interventions prior to the introduction of the letter board. I've just put the amount of time that they'd spent in years in speech therapy, traditional speech therapy involving speech or other forms of augmentative and alternative communication. This is the number of years they were involved in speech therapy prior to the introduction of the letter board. And you can see that for all these participants, it's at least 10 years. And in one person's case, it was over 20 years. Parents reported seeking out letter board opportunities for their children when these other forms of communication were not effective. But another important point I want to make is that it wasn't the case that once they began learning to use the letter board, participants dropped out of these other kinds of therapies. Many of them continued in traditional speech therapy, many of them continued in occupational therapy, ABA, and so forth. So these data were collected as participants took part in a session lasting about 20 minutes. I mentioned that it was done in the wild because what we did was to simulate what happens in an individual session at the center where data collection took place. So what happens in these sessions is that the assistant would read aloud from a prepared lesson and stop at certain points to ask questions and then invite the user to respond. In total, each participant was asked 24 questions over the course of their session. Uh, these are, uh, I forgot to mention, these are the two co-authors of this study, which was published uh, this past summer, Allison Wayne and Hudson Galino. So while participants were engaged in this lesson, which is something they're very familiar with, they were also wearing these eye tracking glasses. We were interested in how their patterns of gaze were related to their spelling. The basic question is, where are they looking as they spell? So these glasses had two cameras attached. This one we call the scene camera, and it captures the central part of the field of view that a user sees. And you can see down here in the inset, <clears throat> and you saw this from the video, this is like pointing out toward the world, capturing part of the field of view that the user sees. There's also an eye camera that's pointed toward the eye. And you can see that in the inset down here, it's represented on the video here. And then the software can generate an estimate of where 
it thinks it's estimating that the uh, participant is looking at a given moment in time. And that appears on this inset here by that red dot. So this red dot right here represents the computer's estimate of where the user is looking. It's important to emphasize that this video here with the red dot, of course, is done in post-processing. So an individual participant who's engaging in the lesson in the study doesn't see a red dot anywhere. It's not happening uh, in the moment. This video with the red dot overlaid is produced after the fact. So I want to show you an example of a participant who's wearing the eye tracking glasses and responding to a question. And you're going to see a red dot right here that represents where the individual is looking. So this is a clip from an 18 year old at the time who'd been spelling for three years. As you watch, I want you to note how his gaze, that is the red dot, anticipates his point to each letter. And this time the voice that you hear is actually the communication partner who's calling out the letters as he touches them. So let me show you this video. I, F, E, E, L, B, O, L, I, K, E, like, W, O, R, L, D, world, I, S, is, W, A, I, T, I, N, G, waiting, O, N, on, M, E. I feel like world is waiting on me. So he's asked, can you think of something you have to wait for? And he says, I feel like world is waiting on me, which, you know, is pretty remarkable. I thought he might say, you know, I, I had to wait in, the uh, in line for the movies or for the bus or something like that. But he spells, I feel like world is waiting on me. One of the things you may have noticed, as I suggested, is that the red dot representing where he's looking generally precedes his point to letters. And the other thing you might have noticed is that um, for this participant, all the time that the letter board was in front of him, he was looking at the letter board. He never looked at the communication partner. So most of the time, and this is his representative of the other participants in this study, when the letter board is in front of them, they're looking at the letter board. So we can, with this video that's produced with the red fixation cursor overlaid, have coders, research assistants code frame by frame for two things. They can identify on a given frame, the, the video is 30 frames a second, so every 33 milliseconds we have a data point. They can identify what letter, if any, is being pointed to, and they can identify what letter, if any, is being looked at. And that would be identified from the red fixation cursor. This data then allows us to calculate a couple of things. It allows us to calculate what we've called interpoint interval which is the amount of time that elapses between when a subject's finger leaves one letter and begins pointing to the next letter. So here you can see a frame representing when the individual's finger is leaving the letter L and when the fin finger arrives at the letter I. This is from that previous video I just showed you. And in this particular case, it was you know, 884 milliseconds. We can also calculate or analyze how often and how long before a point begins, the participant begins looking at the pointed to letter. So in this example, here the fixation cursor representing the participant's gaze is on the letter I, you can see. And in the middle frame, you can see the uh, fixation cursor representing the participant's gaze has already arrived sorry, this is the letter L, <laughs> and then the participant's uh, fixation cursor has already arrived at the letter I, 374 milliseconds later. And then we can also ask how long does it take for the finger to catch up to the I, and in this case it was 510 milliseconds. 
So these are the kinds of things we're able to do with the, the procedure that we I've just outlined. So our first question was, how quickly and accurately do experienced letter board users point to letters? So I'm going to show you a figure that will illustrate the percentage of correctly spelled words for each participant separately. And then in the far right, I'll show you the average across all participants. So here we have on the x-axis, each of the nine participants, their data are being shown separately. That's going to be consistent across all the data that I present to you today. I present the data by individual. And on the y-axis, you can see the percentage of words that they spelled that were spelled correctly. They didn't include uh, a misspell, you know, an insertion of an additional letter or the omission of one or more letters. <clears throat> and you can see that there's some variability among participants, but on average, they're spelling over 80% of the words that they produce correctly. We can also look at the percentage of letters that were pointed to correctly. Again, the data are set up in the same way, participants on the x-axis, one through nine, and the average over here. And on the y-axis, it shows you, it should say percentage of correct letters rather than percentage of correct words, but from zero to 100, and you can see most of the letters that participant point to are correct in the context of the words that they ultimately produce. On average, over 95%. So these participants are very accurate in their spelling. What about the speed with which they spell? So remember, we can investigate this question about interpoint interval. If you're spelling the word cat, for example, how long does it take a participant to get to the A having pointed to the C and then get to the T having pointed to the A? So I have to explain this figure. Uh, you're gonna see a few examples of this kind of uh, layout. Again, on the x-axis, we have all nine participants. <clears throat> On the y-axis, we have interpoint interval, which is just how long from when the finger leaves one letter until it reaches the next letter. Each of these um, functions here is called a violin plot, and each dot within each of those functions represents an individual observation for that participant. So in the case of cat, how long did it take to get from the C to the A? That would be one dot. And how long did it take to get from the A to the T? So within correctly spelled words in a participant session, what you can see here is represented by the red lines <clears throat> is the average and represented by the yellow lines is the median. And in short, most of the there's some variability again, but most of the participants are responding uh, at about one letter every second. So the median interpoint interval is 952 milliseconds. Another way to look at the same data is just to look at a subset of it. We can consider for each participant what their longest sequence of points to correct letters was. This would represent several words, you know, between five and 10. So on, on average, 29 letters, but that, that's equivalent to about five or 10 separate words. And as you can see, the data from participants' longest sequence of correct points lines up pretty well with the data from all the, the points that they made, which is shown in panel A. The median interpoint interval is about one second. So what does this mean? Participants were pointing to the next correct letter from 26 possible letters about one second after their finger left the previous letter. And each participant produced at least one sequence where they rapidly pointed to over 20 correct letters in a row. So if they are responding to cues from the communication partner, this would represent a pretty extraordinary skill. But in fact, it's unlikely that they're doing that, given what we know about human perceptual motor abilities, including Hicks' law that I mentioned earlier. The second question we can ask with these data is how often and by how long do participants look at letters before pointing to them? Remember, this is what we call anticipatory fixations. It's been proposed that letter board users, maybe they simply extend their finger as the assistant rapidly moves the letter board beneath it to each letter. 
So we can use this gaze data to address the possibility. Accurate, goal-directed pointing is normally visually guided. That is to say, when somebody is going to point to something, they usually look at it and then point to it. If participants simply touched letters that the assistant put in front of their finger, they wouldn't be expected to consistently look at letters before their finger made contact with them. So this is an example of where the first look to the letter I, represented by the red dot, began before the finger came into contact with that letter. And so first we just wanted to ask how often do these fixations, these anticipatory fixations, occur? I want to mention here that the definition of a fixation is at least 99 milliseconds where the red fixation cursor is on the target letter before the finger comes into contact with that letter. You'll see on average later on, it's actually about, in our case, about 500 milliseconds, but the criterion for a fixation is 99 consecutive milliseconds where the gaze is on a target letter before the finger comes into contact with that letter. So before I show you the data, and the building, big build up here, I wanna make it clear that we were very conservative in our coding of gaze. The fixation cursor had to be touching a letter for 99 consecutive milliseconds before the finger came into contact with it. So the equipment that we had was good, but it's not perfect. And so what you're gonna see in this clip is that that red fixation cursor, that dot, is often hovering above a letter that the participant points to, but it's not actually touching or making contact with that letter. So these would not be considered anticipatory fixations because remember our criterion for a fixation was more than 99 consecutive milliseconds actually touching some part of the letter before the letter was pointed to. So let me show you this video. This is actually the clip of the same individual you saw earlier without the uh, eye tracking uh, uh, video overlaid. Have you ever experienced uncertainty? And you'll hear again her say the letters aloud as she touches them and in some cases say the words too. But pay attention to the red fixation cursor. Have you ever experienced uncertainty? E, O, V, E, R, Y, very, O, N, E, everyone. D, O, E, S, I, M, N, O, D, I, okay. D, I, F, F, E, R, E, N, T. Different. Everyone does. I am no different. Great. So what I hope you noticed is that there were occasions where the fixation cursor preceded her point to a particular item. Those, of course, then would count as fixations. But there were some times where that red fixation cursor was hovering above a letter. And so even though we might be inclined as you know, subjective observers to view that as also a fixation to that letter, we didn't have the coders count that unless that red dot was actually touching um, the letter for 99 consecutive milliseconds before the finger came into contact with it. OK, so our first question is just how often do participants' eyes perceive their point to a correct letter? How often do they engage in one of these anticipatory fixations before uh, pointing to a letter? Here are the data on the x-axis. Again, you have participants. On the y-axis is the percentage of anticipatory fixations. And each of these red lines represents the observed percentage of anticipatory fixations. So you can see that there's a range. There's some participants, like here, participant three, who I think it's 99% of the time, his gaze preceded his touch by 99 milliseconds or more. Um, um, you know, it's probably falling from, for in general, between 70 and 100%, but we do have some variability. And again, that reflects, I think, in large part, the, um, the precision of the equipment that we had. So one question you have, well, how am I supposed to evaluate these data? Is that a lot? of anticipatory fixations are a little. So in order to address that question, we created a simulation for each participant on the likelihood that given their particular eye tracking profile, they would fixate letters before pointing to them by chance. So this is a simulation that we did. And uh, 
That's represented by these blue lines, these, these uh, uh, box plots down here. And the simulations were run a thousand times for each participant. And what you can clearly see is that for each participant, the percentage of anticipatory fixations generated by these simulations represented in blue is much lower than the percentage of anticipatory fixations that we actually observed. So we believe that participants were looking at letters prior to pointing to them much more often than you would expect if it were just a random uh, path of their eyes. In terms of the timing of anticipatory fixations, as I mentioned, we can look at two things. We can look at the time between the end of a point to the previous letter and the beginning of the fixation to the next letter. That's shown by the, the uh, two images on the left. And here are the data. Again, the nine participants on the x-axis. And what you can see is that the median is about 544 milliseconds. So within about a half a second after their finger leaving one letter, their eye has already reached the next letter. One interesting thing about this plot is that you'll note that there are some dots below zero. These violin plots sometimes extend below zero, and that means that participants did sometimes look at the next letter in a word even before their finger left the previous letter. The second thing we can address is when a fixation to a letter precedes the point to that letter, how much time is there between the beginning of the fixation and when the finger finally catches up. And as you can see in these violin plots, it's also around half a second in general. So um, putting all these pieces together, what do we have? Participants pointed to one of 26 letters about every second or so. You can see that in the interpoint interval. In responses that were sometimes dozens of letters long, and they visually fixated the next letter in a response about 500 milliseconds after pointing to the previous letter, and they only rarely misspelled words. So again, a cueing account of these data where the assistant is delivering some kind of subtle cue that the participants detected, decoded, and responded to is implausible, given existing data on human perceptual motor processing. We also identified two patterns in the interpoint interval and gaze data that when observed in studies with non-autistic typists have been attributed to the cognitive processes that underlie fluent spelling. So let me tell you about those. Turns out that non-autistic adults using a keyboard are slower to type the second morpheme of a compound word than to type letters in either morpheme. So a compound word is a word like sailboat. And in this case, participants are slower to type uh, the B, having just typed the L, than to type any of the letters within either morpheme. S to A, A to I, I to L would be faster than L to B. And this increase in response time at this morpheme boundary between the L and the B is thought to reflect the time that it takes typists to plan production of the second morpheme. So there's no space bar on the letter board. So for our participants, a multi-word response is analogous to a compound word. So the question is whether participants' points between words are slower than their points within words. So example, in the response, I feel like world is waiting on me, does it take more time for them to transition from the I to the F than to transition to any of the letters within the word feel, and then from, let's see, the E to the W, then to uh, transition from any of the, uh, between any of the letters within the, the word world, and so on. And the answer is yes. So in this figure, the light blue is the time to point to the first letter in a new word within a response, and the dark blue represents the time to point to letters within a word. So as you can see, in all participants' data, 
they're slower to point to the first letter in a new word than to point to letters within words. We can also ask questions about what predicts time between points within words. It's not surprising, but it's good to see that the distance between letters on the letter board predicts this reaction time. So if you're spelling cat with a single finger on the letter board, of course the A is closer to the C than the T is to the A, so you'll be faster to get to the A than you will be to get to the T. The data bear that out as I'll show you in a moment. But more interestingly, bigram frequency within a word predicts the time between points above and beyond distance. So for example, bigram just means two letters that go together in a word. So for example, th is much more common within words than is ht. So th with, them, etc. whereas ht is less common to be a word like height. Turns out that non-autistic typists are faster to type pairs of letters the more frequent those pairs of letters are. So they'd be faster to type th than to type ht. So we can ask whether participants are faster in our study to get to the second letter in more frequent bigrams than less frequent bigrams, controlling for distance, controlling for how far apart they are on the letter board. So I'm gonna show you the data. This is a bit of a complicated figure, but bear with me. All the patterns are the same across the nine participants. Each participant is represented in a different panel. So let's just focus on participant one up here in the upper left. On the x-axis is the distance between two letters in a bigram within a word. So let's say the distance in pixels between the T and the H. And what you can see clearly, and this is represented across all the panels, is that the farther apart, don't pay attention yet to the difference between the two lines, but the farther apart uh, uh, the letters in a bigram are, the longer it takes participants to point to the second letter. And that's represented on the y-axis, which is essentially uh, interpoint interval reaction time. Okay, what I wanna draw your attention to though, is the difference between these two parallel lines, between the solid line and the dotted line. So <clears throat> the solid line represents bigrams that are relatively frequent, for example, th. And the dotted line represents bigrams that are relatively infrequent, for example, ht. So what these data show is that participants were faster to point to the second letter in the more frequent bigrams represented by the solid line compared to the less frequent bigrams represented by the dotted line, even when controlling for the distance between letters. And the patterns uh, for gaze for both the um, between versus within words analysis and this predicting um, by bigram frequency holds up in the gaze data as well. I'm not gonna show you those data separately, but they're available in the supplementary materials of the paper if you're interested. This is exactly what you would expect of individuals who had internalized and were drawing upon orthographic regularities in English as they spelled. So, the accuracy, speed, timing, and visual fixation patterns that we've documented suggest that participants were looking to and pointing to letters that they selected themselves, not letters that they were cued to by the assistant. In short, participants showed what we call communicative agency. And these findings are consistent with what you would expect if participants were conveying their own thoughts. I need to be clear about something here. We're not making claims about everyone. This was a unique sample of experienced letterboard users. I'm not claiming that all non-speaking autistic people can learn to convey their thoughts using this method, but our findings demonstrate that the blanket dismissal of assisted autistic communication is unwarranted. I wanna conclude by returning to the seminar that I taught at the University of Virginia that helped to inspire this work. 
you know, as we learn more about autism, particularly from autistic people themselves, I think we're also learning how little we understand about autism and that many of our assumptions about autistic people are, are just wrong. So I want to thank the autistic and non-autistic students in the seminar for helping to move autism science in a progressive data-driven direction. And of course, also to thank the participants in this study for their willingness to participate and the research assistants in my lab, Andrew Howe and Sydney Cadogan, for doing the careful coding of the data that I presented to you today. And finally, thanks to the students in my lab, some of whom you can see here from a, a Zoom meeting earlier in the year. And thanks to the New Jersey Autism Center of Excellence for inviting me to participate. Um, if you'd like to learn more about the work we do, please feel free to visit my lab's website, which is www.jazzwalllab.org. Thanks. <laughs>